described himself in many ways. But if we concentrate on man in relation to his control over his environment, no description is more apt than the description of man as a tool-making animal. And in the short history of mankind, the majority of the tools which man has made can be thought of as an extension of his muscle power. That is, the ability to perform work faster and in greater quantity. mid-1940s of the 20th century, a different kind of tool was invented. A tool for extending certain of the powers of man's mind. This tool is the electronic computer. reliable and tireless performance of a variety of arithmetic and logical operations that gives the computer its great utility and power. But merely looking at a computer won't tell us very much about what it actually is doing. Neither will this tell us anything about the revolutionary material and intellectual effects of such machines. We can easily see the material and intellectual effects of, say, machines for transportation. We know that the modern jet aircraft represents a great increase in speed over the earliest aircraft. We also know that modern airplanes have made the world smaller and changed our way of thinking about ourselves and our world. And future means of transportation will bring even more rapid and radical changes. But even the difference between the speed of an ox cart and the fastest rocket is small when compared with the difference in speed between calculation by hand and calculation by computer. For example, the first electronic calculator to be completed could do the work of 50,000 people working by hand. Scientists, when they speak of a great change in speed or size, prefer to speak in terms of a unit of measurement called an order of magnitude, meaning 10 times as much. Dr. Richard Hemming, a research mathematician for the Bell Telephone Laboratories, in a paper presented before a meeting of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, put it this way. The computer revolution is often compared with the famous Industrial Revolution in importance and scope. The Industrial Revolution effectively freed man from being a beast of burden. The computer revolution will similarly free him from dull, repetitive routine. The computer revolution is, however, perhaps better compared with the Copernican or the Darwinian Revolution, both of which greatly changed man's idea of himself and the world in which he lives. Before getting into the main part of this paper, it is necessary to discuss briefly the idea of a change in a technology. Change is often measured in units of an order of magnitude, meaning roughly a factor of 10, 10 times as much. It is a common observation that a change of an order of magnitude in a technology produces fundamentally new effects. As an illustration, consider the following example. Modern jet planes are about one order of magnitude faster than Wright Brothers' first plane. Another example, the fastest missiles are somewhat more than two orders of magnitude faster, meaning about three ti 300 times faster. Automobiles are used at speeds around one order of magnitude faster than a horse and wagon. Each of these have produced whole new effects. Indeed, it is said that the automobile has produced even a change in our morals. Computers have improved in speed by at least six orders of magnitude, a millionfold. 
In order to understand the factor of a million, consider the following two situations. First, that you have only one dollar, and second, that you have a million dollars. You can readily see that in the two situations, there are fundamentally different effects. You adopt a different view of yourself and the world in which you live. Along with the change in speed, there has been a great increase in reliability, so we now do much longer computations than were practical by hand. Finally, with the increase in speed, there has been a corresponding decrease in the cost. Something more than 1,000 times cheaper. It is as if suddenly automobiles cost two to four dollars, houses 20 to 60 dollars. And the changes in the computer technology are still going on. These then are the We hardly need to be reminded that we live in a world that is becoming more complicated and more crammed with information every day. One description for this vast quantity of data on everything from the lifetime earning records of an individual to the beeps and pulses relayed to Earth from a space satellite uses that overworked word, explosion. This time, an information explosion. The computer is an invaluable tool for processing these millions of bits of information in accurate, fast, and economical fashion, in accordance with rules and instructions provided by the human programmer. In the most gigantic of all record-keeping jobs, the social security system, more than one million personal records can be processed in one day. This manufacturing plant is entirely computer-controlled in accordance with rules for decision-making stored in the machine's memory. This chemical plant for making polyisoprene was designed by a computer. In a recent example, a computer in 16 hours and out of 16,000 possible designs selected the design that most closely approached the ideal design as defined by the engineers. In this actual firing of the multi-million dollar Saturn rocket was simulated on this computer many times before the actual firing was authorized. And these simulated firings, which helped eliminate many of the problems in the functioning of the rocket, cost only a fraction of what an actual launching would have cost. Each of these operations, record keeping and accounting, control, design, and simulation, is achieved through the manipulation of numbers according to instructions and rules given to the computer by the programmer. But what are these rules, and what is the relationship between numbers and the real things they are said to represent? These are some of the questions that we put to the scientist, and we've already seen, Dr. Richard Hemming, research mathematician at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. Well, I would say that at present at the Bell Telephone Laboratories, we do about 10% of the experiments on a computer and about 90% in the laboratory. I would expect that in time we will do 90% on the computer and 10% in the lab. Speed, cost, and effort favor the computer over the laboratory approach. This advantage is possible because we construct a mathematical model rather than a material model. I use the word construct because the mathematical equations are the construction rather than a materialistic physical model. It is perhaps fortunate we have found, particularly in the field of physical sciences, that our predictions based upon the mathematical models agree very well with what we observe in the physical world. The 19th century physicist Heinrich Hertz described the concept of a model in these words. We make for ourselves internal pictures or symbols of external objects. And we make them of such a kind that the necessary consequences in thought of the internal pictures are always pictures of the necessary consequences in nature of the object symbolized. The idea of a mathematical model is fairly easy to understand. A very simple, trivial example is the numbers you calculate on your check stubs. You combine the various numbers by addition and subtraction, and they correspond, in a very real sense, to the amount of money that you have in the bank. The mathematical model is the numbers you manipulate, the amount of money you actually have in the bank is the physical world. Let us consider now a slightly more complex example. This is a common experience for most of us. The front end of the car dips sharply when we come to a sudden stop. In technical language, there is a transfer of weight 
from rear to front in the action of braking. A mathematical model of this transfer of weight can reveal exactly how much weight is on both wheels. And different road surfaces and braking conditions will result in different weight distributions. But the mathematical model for the transfer of weight from rear to front will remain the same. In this mathematical model of a behavior of an automobile, we can use a computer to simulate what would happen in actual practice. We have actually found that our mathematical models of automobile traffic predict very well many of the effects which we observe. Returning to our more general remarks about the use of computers, we first use computers to simulate situations in engineering, situations which we had been doing before by hand. The computer has allowed us to do much larger and more complex problems. But this ignored the order of magnitude effect which we spoke of. We are now beginning to use the machines in entirely new ways on entirely different problems. And this is the exciting part. This is the intellectual aspect of applying the machines to completely new ideas that has so excited many people in the field. One of the uh, characteristics of human beings is uh, uh, that, among other things that they do, is that they solve problems. And what it means, of course, to solve a problem is uh, being able to not only get an answer to uh, a question that arises in a particular situation, but then uh, to find other cases that are similar to the initial one, so that we are, in effect, in a position to solve not just one concrete problem, but a whole class of them. This is well, Professor example, Ernest Nagel, uh, the leading logician and philosopher when, uh, from Columbia uh, University. Once a domain has been developed to the point where uh, answers can be uh, given from given set of assumptions uh, simply by following uh, some uh, set of instructions or uh, some rules, then it's not entirely evident that one should be thinking of the significance of every step that one is performing. Well, is it also possible to instruct the machines to follow the rules of thought? Indeed, I think this is, of course, uh, the basis for having uh, machines or computers, uh, since their uh, entire task consists in following a set of rules or programs uh, so that uh, in a very uh, short uh, span of time uh, they're able to come out with an answer uh, that would have taken uh, human beings an extraordinary length of time to produce. It seems to me that the computers, because they enable us to ask new questions, also enable us to get entirely new answers. They do not answer all the old questions, but because the questions are new, the answers are also new and very exciting. There is a strong tendency to speak of the machine as solving the problem, when in fact, really it is the program which describes to the machine what the machine is to do. This is overlooked, and I think a great deal of confusion arises from this. It is not that we do not have adequate machines to solve our problems many times, but rather we lack adequate descriptions of how to solve the problem. This is a very important point to understand. As we spread out and learn more and more about our techniques of solving problems, we will be able to do wire and wire class of problems. It is not the machine so much as it is our lack of ideas that controls. Mathematics has been called the one universal language of mankind. It is perhaps our most powerful tool for problem solving. And in terms of subject matter, pure mathematics and logic are one and the same. The subject matter consists in the relations generally expressed by if, then necessarily. Computers have been called machines for logic. The human problem solver must first define the problem. He must also provide the machine with instructions as to the steps necessary to solve the problem. And then the machine will carry out these instructions accurately and with fantastic speed. All of this, of course, requires very precise logical thinking on the part of the problem solver. It is the machine's power to carry out these logical operations that gives it its great value as a tool for extending man's thought. Logic is not the science of how we think,
thinking involves much more than logic. It is essential to logic and mathematics that, given a set of premises, the conclusion will follow in all cases. Results from a computer are the necessary conclusions arising from the data and rules of operation provided the machine by the human programmer. And yet, these conclusions can accurately reflect and foretell real-life situations. What is the nature of this remarkable correspondence between the abstract symbols of mathematics and logic and the real perceptible world of objects and events? We ask Professor Nagel to comment on this. Well, I, I would like to uh, say something about that because this has been, uh, I suppose, for many, many centuries, a problem that has occupied uh, men uh, and uh, because of the apparent uh, agreement of what we might call reality or nature with uh, the language that we employ, whether it is ordinary English or whether it is the language of mathematics, uh, the apparent agreement uh, between reality and uh, the symbolic representation, uh, men have speculated about, uh, sometimes about the origin of the world, uh, something about uh, the necessity of there being some particular uh, kind of uh, creative agency. And so, if one asks, why is it that the consequences of assumptions that we make are in agreement with na in nature, the answer is because nothing can count as an instance of the assumptions that we make unless the assumptions themselves are confirmed. The electronic computer in the service of the human problem solver reflects back to him the consequences of the assumptions he employs when he builds a mathematical model of a real life situation. Uh, so that rather than saying, as for example, uh, the late uh, Sir James Jeans maintained that the fact that mathematics is used in exploring nature uh, he maintained that this shows that uh, there must have been a divine creator that, and moreover that the creator was a mathematician. In terms of this uh, simple reminder of uh, the sorts of things that enter into applying any formal system to any segment of nature, uh, one would have to say the reason why nature conforms uh, to our assumptions uh, is not that there was a mathematician who created it, but simply that nothing would count as an instance of the assumptions unless it also conformed to whatever consequence was deduced from it. The problem-solving power of mathematics and logic, combined with the speed and accuracy of a machine for carrying out these operations, is the basis of the computer revolution. But does this mean that a computer can produce a new idea or make an original contribution to knowledge? We ask this question of both Professor Nagel and Dr. Hamming. It depends entirely upon what you mean by a new idea. In some senses, the machine only produces what you expect. On the other hand, you do not foresee all combinations, and the machine often produces combinations which you had not foreseen and have the impression of novelty. Well, the question is to whether uh, machines or computers are capable of uh, original thought or of making uh, original contributions to knowledge uh, is a very much debated one, but before one can profitably discuss it, it seems to me it's very important to distinguish between two senses in which uh, a statement or an idea might be said to be original. The two senses are a psychological sense of originality and a logical sense of originality. And I think uh, perhaps the best way of making the distinction clear is first with an illustration. Uh, when a child is given a, an elementary arithmetical problem, for example, to find the sum of two numbers, uh, when he gets the answer, uh, the conclusion is something that is novel or new to him. So psychologically, of course, he gets the sense of having made a discovery. Uh, nevertheless, the answer is, is 
something that is necessarily or logically implied in the premises or the assumptions uh, and the process of thought here simply is to unravel or make explicit what was already contained in a logical sense in the premises. I think I risk uh, uh, going out on a limb here and say that it seems to me that uh, at least on the basis of our present conceptions of the capacities of uh, computers as well as the actual ones that have been constructed that uh, uh, computers do not come up with logically new ideas and uh, unless the nature of the beast changes very radically that they cannot come up with logically new ideas given the assumptions that underlie the present theory of computers. Many people are attempting to use computers to replace man. I am much more interested myself in using man and machines as a working combination. I believe that some of the future is already fairly clear. It is obvious that the machines can do routine logical consequences much more rapidly and much more accurately than a human can. Therefore, I believe we will gradually push the detailed logical parts, the methods which we use onto the machine and we will reserve for ourselves the creation of new ideas and the direction of the research. Thus, the man-machine combination will find a dividing line passing gradually from man over to machine, the machine taking more and more of the burden as we learn how to use the machines and as the machines become more powerful. And we will find ourselves left in the more creative aspects of the problem, deciding what it is worth attacking, what are the problems which we wish to solve, these kind of questions we do not know how to give the computer and seem best reserved for man at present. I think we have to say that uh, in this respect, uh, the human mind is capable of doing things that uh, none of the machines that are uh, available today is capable of doing. This certainly doesn't foreclose the question whether sometime in the future uh, machines might not be devised so that uh, uh, exactly this kind of a thing will be credited to machines, but at present, and this is all that one can say at the moment, uh, there, is, there are clear lines of demarcation between the capacities of the human mind in respect to uh, the capacity to make contributions to knowledge which is our original. Dr. Hamming, will you give me some of your summary thoughts on this computer revolution? Well, the word revolution is used very freely these days, and yet I think there's some meaning to the words the computer revolution. We have got an increase in computers of a millionfold, decrease in costs by a thousand, as we said before. This is a very real change. But the question still arises, will this revolution continue? It seems to me, in view of the political situation in the whole world, that no responsible group can oppose the coming computer revolution. Therefore, it seems to me we have a real one which will continue. Now, I believe that the reports we hear of this revolution are very misleading. They often underestimate the speed which it is going on and the importance. But worst of all, they tend to emphasize the material aspects, how much we will have of this and that, how much leisure, what wonderful new things we will have. And they fail to discuss the impact it will have on our view of ourselves and our world outlook. This, I believe, is the most important part of the computer revolution. I do think that uh, as a consequence of these increased uh, com complexities in society and the uh, obviously greater uh, degree of control that will have to be uh, uh, exercised if we are not going to run into each other constantly, uh, it does uh, require us to think seriously as to how in the future uh, we, or perhaps more specifically our children and grandchildren, uh, will be able to realize the potentialities uh, that we would like our own society to enable us to develop. We shall have to find ways of training ourselves how to enjoy the leisure that we presumably are going to have, the greater leisure that we're going to have, in such a way that instead of being frustrating and making life a perpetual boredom, will enable us to engage in uh, creative activities. This seems to me uh, to be the central problem 
that faces uh, Western civilization insofar as the material goods of life are going to be increased, but it does uh, raise a fundamental uh, issue as to how what was sometimes called the spiritual aspect of, of life, or uh, I would prefer to call it the creative aspect of individuality, will be given uh, a, a room for development. Now, there's no simple answer to this question. If there is any mystery in the computer revolution, let's be sure that the mystery is located in the right place. In spite of its magnetic memory, complex circuitry, and so on, the mystery is not in the machine. The sense of awe and mystery that we may experience when we see a computer in operation is really awe at the accumulated months and years of thinking by human problem solvers reflected back to us at fantastic speed. A computer scientist once remarked that we have machines that compute with the speed of light, but with the intelligence of the earthworm. While it is true that the computer can be called a kind of brain, although a very limited one, in order to solve any problem, the computer must first be instructed by a human programmer who has painstakingly and logically analyzed the problem. The computer is then given the problem in the form of numbers or instructions pertinent to arithmetic. It is the arithmetic logical task that the computer is organized to do. Once instructed, it can do as much arithmetic in a minute as a man in a lifetime. A man in a lifetime. The lifetime of all mankind is but a brief moment in the long history of this earth of ours. And only yesterday in the history of mankind has man made any significant advance in his control over his earthly environment. Computers machines for logic may change this more than any other of man's inventions. These machines, which have been with us less than a millionth of a second in terms of the temporal span of man's history, have already given promise of deep and far-reaching change in our way of life and way of thinking. They literally accelerate into milliseconds of time our ability to perform logical, arithmetic, and controlled tasks. But finally, the future, except in terms of trends and probabilities, is the great unknown. And the uses to which we put ourselves in relation to the marvelous machines of our own invention is perhaps the central moral and intellectual challenge of our own brief moment in time. NET, National Educational Television.